Today, I'm going to give a brief introduction to public choice. We'll cover some of my favorite ideas from public choice. But of course, the field is very large, so we're only going to touch on a few ideas. First, what is public choice? Public choice is political science influenced by the economic way of thinking. Like political science, public choice attempts to understand how public policies come to be adopted and what the influence of different institutions are on the political process. Unlike a lot of political science, public choice typically assumes that political actors act in their rational self-interest and respond to incentives just like everyone else. A key idea is thus analytical egalitarianism. Everyone is modeled in the same way. We assume that voters, politicians, and bureaucrats, just like consumers, entrepreneurs, and managers, act in their rational self-interest. Now note that self-interest doesn't necessarily mean greedy or materialistic. We can think, for example, about politicians as being vote maximizers. Why are they trying to maximize the number of votes? Some politicians may want power to do good for the world while other politicians may want power for its own sake or to increase their self-esteem. And we don't have to get into the underlying motivations in order to create a useful model. The goal of public choice is to find an equilibrium given these assumptions. What happens when all the political actors are acting in their rational self-interest and they interact with one another? And for these purposes, scholars in public choice often create mathematical models. A model helps to logically work out what the consequences of our assumptions, about preferences and constraints, what the consequences are for electoral equilibrium, the behavior of bureaucracy, the political power of interest groups, differences between democracies and dictatorships, the importance and operation of constitutions, and how to design better constitutions, voting systems, and so forth. Now you might say, isn't it obvious that politicians act in their self-interest? And to some extent it is. But when Buchanan and Tulloch published The Calculus of Consent in 1962, and William Riker, The Theory of Political Coalitions, and a little bit later, The Logic of Collective Action by Mansur Olson, this approach to understanding politics was really a revolution. Even today, it's very common for people, even economists and political scientists, to put forward ideas which could only work if the government were a benevolent dictator. So one important use of public choice is to counteract the Nirvana fallacy. The Nirvana fallacy is rejecting a realistic solution because it doesn't meet the standards of an imaginary perfect solution. Here's an example of the Nirvana fallacy. Some people have argued that seatbelts could trap a person in a car crash, so seatbelts shouldn't be worn. Well, the fallacy is that seatbelts save lives on average, of course. No solution is perfect. Applied to public choice, there are many scholars and pundits who often commit the Nirvana fallacy by comparing an imperfect market solution to a perfectly working government solution the benevolent dictator assumption. To avoid the Nirvana fallacy, you must compare realistic market with realistic government. Now I said earlier that in many ways public choice is a revolution, but it was also a renaissance or a rediscovery. The designers of the US Constitution, for example, were heavily influenced by the classical economists like Adam Smith and David Hume, and they were early public choice scholars. Here's a wonderful statement from James Madison. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the government, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. Now let's break down this statement. Ambition. Ambition is another word for self-interest. So Madison was assuming that actors are self-interested. 
Now, what does Madison say the goal of a constitution is? He wants a government that does useful things, that controls the governed in a useful way, and yet is controlled itself. That is, a government that does not constrain itself gets out of control, and we don't want that. And how does Madison say to do this? He says, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Here, Madison is saying that the designer of a constitution must design it so that when political actors act in their self-interest, the resulting equilibrium is the social good. In other words, the designers of a constitution must try to channel self-interest towards the social good. The visible hand must operate like the invisible hand. That's a brilliant summary of public choice. One important aspect of public choice is a theory of government failure to match or counterbalance the theory of market failure. In the next few videos, I'll discuss some of the key aspects of the theory of government failure. Stay tuned.